when I was a kid and going to vacation Bible school, that would be the song that would be playing every time when we all ran into the sanctuary to find our seats. And uh, the psalm that we're going to look at tonight is one, it's called Psalms of Ascent. And there's a bunch of them right around Psalm 125, which we're looking at tonight. And the Psalm of Ascent means that it was a song that they sung on their way up to the temple. So as they were coming from all different directions, this would be one of the songs that they would sing on their way, on their way up. So Psalm 125 is what we're reading tonight. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. Just note there, Mount Zion is the location of the temple. It's not exactly a mountain. It's, it's a high place for sure. But uh, that is where the temple is. Which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people, both now and and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, cannot be shaken, endures forever. We don't have mountains around here, but what's something that's around here that might, that without, you would say, cannot be shaken? It, it's just always there. What, we don't have mountains, so what would, what would we say, maybe? Okay, that was, that was one that came to mind. That's, that's always there, yeah. Anything else? Maybe you hit the bullseye right there. <laughs> no, um, I've never lived more than 45 minutes away from the lake, so... Yeah, that works. It's, it's this massive body of water. It's always there. It doesn't dry up. Sometimes the water levels are higher or lower, but it's always there. And especially during the winter time, uh, it lets itself be known when all of the snow dumps on us constantly. But yeah, the question is, where is our trust and where do we find our security? Where do we have our trust? What makes us feel safe? What can we, what do we think of that, that's always there and we know and find our trust in that? So, like for example, if you think about thunderstorms or, you know, potentially a really bad thunderstorm like, like a tornado or something like that, you have your house and your, in your basement that you can go into and there, your, your security is there. When you have bills coming at you, you, you have a checkbook that you can use to, to, to keep you safe from, uh, from all of that. And, well, not this doesn't apply to, to those who grow their own food, but for those of us who have to buy their food, there's always the grocery store right there. And, and it, it always has food in it. And the food just magically appears there, you know? And it's, it's just great. It's always there. And if, if uh, we don't have to worry about any foreign invasion or anything like that, is Canada going to invade us? I'd, I'd probably say more likely we'd, we'd invade them before they invade us. They're, they're way too friendly to invade um, and we have the most advanced military in the world. If you 
look at how much we spend on our military and how much technology and research is going into you know the latest and greatest weapons and um, information um, we spend more than like the top 20 nations combined and if somebody were to attack you or at least if somebody were to attack me I've got I've got my martial arts hands here and I can always defend myself right so if I'm walking down some scary place or there's some some rowdy people around me and I'm maybe a little nervous oh boy I'm somebody might see me and think oh hey here's a, here's an easy target I might have to pull these out or something but I feel it makes me feel a little tough like hey I'm, I, I have some security here I'm not invincible by any means but but I have some security there some of you have uh, guns and maybe um, licenses to, to carry concealed weapons and stuff so maybe maybe that's where you find some trust and security but all of these earthly things that we put our trust in they can be gone in a second all of these things they could be gone in a second so I might be able to throw some good punches and kicks but if somebody came up behind me really well and got a really good first hit on me I probably wouldn't be able to do very well I'm definitely not bulletproof and the grocery store you know hey if if there were no farms there would be no food right farmers yeah I mean I mean it's easy for me to think oh the food just magically appears there and that's that's the way it works but but it wouldn't take wouldn't take a ton to make that go away there's countries where there's the shelves are all empty all these earthly things can be gone in an instant in verse 1 it says the Lord is the only thing that cannot be moved there's only one thing that we can put our trust in that is not going to fail us that's not going to be taken away and that's our God and if you look at Israel they had many things to be afraid of we don't have a whole lot to be afraid of and we have a lot of security and a lot of these things too even though they can be gone in a second we 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 don't have to worry about famines and plagues and invading nations and those kinds of things but they did they had to worry about that a lot and of the many ancient peoples Israel was maybe the most unlikely to endure in high school sometimes people are voted most likely to be successful if you were in the ancient times and you looked at all the nations out there and you saw Israel you probably would not vote them most likely to last the next thousand years or so they were not very advanced they were not very strong and there were many other nations that were much larger and much stronger and those nations some of them anyways those nations disappeared into history but not Israel so you had large powerful nations like Assyria this was a warrior state I mean everybody everybody contributed to the war effort and every summer they would go around and conquer more lands and take more tribute and the whole society was just geared towards this conquering machine 
the Hittites, they were one of the first people to develop iron. And they disappeared. In fact, nobody knows why they collapsed. They just were gone all of a sudden. And there was a time when people thought that maybe the Hittites were a group that somebody made up. And then all of a sudden they came upon this this, whoa, this whole civilization. And then there were all these smaller nations, but were very advanced in some ways or another. Moab, Edom, Aram, Phoenicia, Philistia, Amalek, Midian, the Nabataeans, they're gone. They don't exist anymore. Israel, the Jews... They're still here. Even now. In verse 2, it says, God surrounds His people. God surrounds His people. And He certainly watched over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The fact that they existed when all of these other nations collapsed and were absorbed into bigger nations this is, this is a miracle. God certainly was watching out for them. He certainly surrounded His people. And He still does today. If you want to imagine, imagine walking around with a force field around you. Nothing goes in without God's saying, Okay. Nothing happens to us without his say so. When Satan wanted to afflict Job, he had to get God's permission. And even then, God says, You can only go this far, no farther. And when we say, um, Question and answer one from the Heidelberg Catechism. There's one line in there that says, All things must work together for my salvation. All things. So even if God lets in things that are bad or unpleasant or awful, things that we hate, all things work together for our salvation. And look at verse 3. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. For then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Okay, the scepter, that's what, that's what, I don't know if you know what a scepter is, that's what kings held. So sometimes you might see kings of of long ago, pictures of them with, with this like gold staff or something like that. That would be a scepter. And it was a sign of authority. Kind of like in Psalm 23 where it says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The staff is a symbol of a shepherd's authority. A scepter is a symbol of the king's authority. Now, God's people, okay, it says the scepter of the wicked will not remain. God's people had many evil rulers. Many. Many. And if you tallied them up, the, the evil ones greatly outnumber the good. So I have, I have a few slides here that I dug up from another sermon. This kind of goes through the history of Israel here. We had King Saul and then King David and then King Solomon and then the kingdom split into two. And there was Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom, And they split, hit the next one there. So then we had two sets of kings. The red ones are the ones that are bad. And you notice that the red ones kind of pile up quite a bit here. Lots of red. And then the black is because they were the worst. I mean, it literally says in the Bible that Ahab and Jezebel were the worst of the northern kingdom. All right, and the next one, a lot more red there. 
Oh, we got one blue, but oh, another blue, but mostly, mostly red. Hit it again. These are all the kings. And again, okay. Finally, the northern kingdom gets defeated by Assyria. And then Judah has their worst king. And then a bunch of other bad ones after that. And one more there. And then Judah finally collapses and they go into exile. And then Persia conquers Babylon. And then some people stay in Babylon, some people go back. But you notice all of the red kings there. Lots of bad ones. And in the end, God, you could see just putting it all together like that, God was still looking out for His people and they still endured. They got to go back home. But how is it that the scepter of the wicked will not remain? How could they say that with so many bad kings like that? How is that, how is that true? I mean... The longest reign of all of those kings was Manasseh, the worst one of Judah. He reigned 55 years. And then after they went back, they were conquered by Greeks and the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and then Rome. They had tons of wicked rulers. Well, Here's what I think. I think this is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the eternal king. He's the only one who really can fit this description. Because God's people, the people of Israel, they had tons of bad rulers. You know, it says in verse 2, both now and forevermore that God surrounds His people. Jesus is the eternal King. In verse 4, it says, Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. Well, you might notice that lots of bad things happen to God's good people. It doesn't seem like God's people are better off than others. In some places of the world, it seems like they're much worse off. But not everything we think is good is actually good for us. Not everything that we think of as good is is really good for us. So, for example... Some of you have young kids and some of you had young kids. If, you're, if you let your young kids, let's say you're, you're five year old or, or whatever, if you let them pick what they wanted to eat all the time, you ask them what they wanted to eat, what kinds of things would they pick? What, what, do, what do young kids, what would they pick all the time? Okay, chocolate chip cookies and chocolate milk. Anything else? What would young kids want to eat? Pizza. Candy. What else? Mac and cheese. Okay. That might be the healthiest thing we've got so far. What else do kids want to eat if you let them pick? Ice cream. Okay. Some nutritional value there. You get your dairy and stuff. Okay, any, anything else? Is there, there, there's a reason why we don't let our kids pick the menu for the coming week. Because even though it tastes good, all of those things, it's not actually a good, healthy diet. 
if you let your kids make their own schedule, and almost any, any kid, it would be play, 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 no school, no work, no chores, just do whatever I want. Now, God is the perfect father who knows better than we do. There's a reason we call him father. That's one of the most common words for God in the Bible. His father. And because he's God, he's also perfect. We all have had human fathers and some of them are better than others, but they're all flawed in one way or another. God is our perfect father, and he, he knows better than we do. And the good things that God has for us might feel bad. Sometimes the things that we think are bad things are the things that we actually need. Not all bad things all the time, but some. Some of the, a lot of those bad things, the, the things that we just dislike the most, might be the things that we need the most. We're actually like little children who don't want to eat vegetables or do homework. That's, that's us. That's kind of the extent of, of what we think is good and how we would want to use our time. Verses 4 and 5, Do good to the o Lord to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Kids who grow up doing homework and eating vegetables will grow up better than those whose parents let them do whatever they want. If you let your kids walk all over you, they will not turn out to be very good adults. The, the kids that have to eat their vegetables, that have to do their homework, that have chores to do, they turn out to be functioning adults. They don't expect things to just get handed to them all the time. They, they work hard. And they might not eat as healthy as we want them to, but they still have at least a, an awareness that, hey, I can't just eat cake and ice cream all day, every day. In the same way, those who have their heart on the Lord will grow up better than those who do whatever they want. Do good to the Lord, O Lord, to those who are upright in heart. If we have our hearts set on the Lord, set on the things above, then we are going to grow up better off than if we just did whatever we wanted to. And those are some hard lessons to learn and they don't necessarily come overnight. You don't learn to like to do your homework or like to eat mushrooms or Brussels sprouts or whatever you don't like to eat. But the more we set our sights on heavenly blessings, the more we'll appreciate the vegetables and the homework that God gives us. Even if we don't enjoy it, we'll at least recognize what God's trying to do. And instead of fighting him on it, we'll actually, maybe even sometimes we'll say thank you. So the world can take away our pizza, our pop, our Cheetos, our cake and ice cream. If we never had those things again, it would be a bummer, but we'd be fine. In the same way... The world can take away all of its good stuff, all of its securities, but if we have the Lord, 
and our heart is on him, we'll be fine. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our God in heaven, we're thankful for all the things that you do for us. Lord, even some of the things that we don't like, we, Lord, we, we want to thank you for those things too. And Lord, we pray that we would recognize your work and your activity in our lives, even when things are going wrong. Help us to see, Lord, that you are challenging us, you are working on us, and you are teaching us to trust you. And Lord, we pray that we would all grow up in our salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.